Cryptid Hunters by Roland Smith. Chapter 1. Terrible News. Marty and Grace O'Hara were twins, but you wouldn't know it if you saw them together. Marty has brown hair, eyes the color of rain clouds, and he is a foot taller than his sister. Grace has black hair, startling blue eyes, the color of robin's eggs, and she is a foot smarter than her brother. The O'Hara twins were at the Omega Opportunity Preparatory School in Switzerland when they received the worst news of their lives. Marty was illustrating a comic book with his best friend and roommate, Luther Smith, when his art instructor, Mr. Umbar, tapped him on the shoulder and said, you are wanted in the headmaster's office. Again. Marty shrugged. He was sent to Dr. Bartholomew Beasel's office at least once a week, sometimes two or three times, for various infractions of the rules, of which there were many. The only thing that surprised him was that this time Luther wasn't being summoned as well. They were usually punished together, which saved the headmaster a great deal of time and effort. Give my regards to Dr. Weasel, Luther said. I will, Marty assured him. As always, Marty took his time getting to the office. He chatted with friends, went to the restroom to muss his hair, and pulled his shirt tail out. This drove the headmaster wild, and stopped in the kitchen to tell the chef he would be by later to help her roll out the dough for the cheese biscuits. When he finally arrived at the office, he was shocked to find his sister Grace sitting on one of the uncomfortable chairs outside the headmaster's door. What are you doing here? Little Grace never broke the rules. Grace stared at him mutely with an expression he hadn't seen on her face in a very long time. It worried him. When, he get in, when we get inside, he said, you better let me do the talking. Grace started res to respond, but was interrupted by the massive door swinging open and the tall, skeletal Dr. Bartholomew Beasel come beckoning them into his inner sanctum. Seated around his long conference table were the school's nurse, counselor, chaplain, and, two, and their two dormitory supervisors and three teachers who had known the twins since they began attending the school this seven years before. Marty looked at the staff's grim, solemn expression and knew that something had gone very, very wrong. I didn't do it, he insisted. Dr. Beasel ignored Marty's shirt tail, his wild hair, and all his too familiar disclaimer. There has been a terrible accident, he said. I'm afraid your parents are... Grace fainted before Dr. Beasel was able to finish. The nurse jumped up from her chair and together with the chaplain and counselor's help laid her out on the sofa. I'll get my smelling salts, the nurse said and ran out of the office. Marty, who had seen Grace's emotions overwhelm her like this before, was not overly concerned. He glared around the room in angry frustration at the fussing adults until he could stand it no longer, then shouted, Our parents are what? Everyone stopped what they were doing and stared at him helplessly. Dr. Beasel slithered over and put his long, slender arm around his least favorite student's shoulders. I'm afraid your parents are missing, he said. Marty sank into the nearest chair. Both of them? Dr. Beasel gave him a sad nod. A helicopter crash in the Amazon. The pilot was found dead. A conflagration. Marty blinked. A what? He didn't know what the word meant, but it sounded bad. Grace, who had recovered without smelling salts and was now sobbing uncontrollably, said, A fire, Marty. A terrible fire. Marty joined his sister in her bewildered despair. The next morning, the news was all over the local papers and on the lips of every student and teacher in the school. The twins retreated to Grace's private table in the back of the school library to escape all the sympathetic murmurs and curious stares. Grace spent more time at this table than she did in her dormitory room she shared with her best friend, Brenda Scrivens. No one was allowed to use Grace's table. 
I have something to tell you, she said, holding her stuffed monkey. At least it was thought to be a monkey. The fabric was covered with patches and s s and stitches that looked like scars. Its left arm, mouth, and ears were long gone. She had since she'd had it since she was a baby and called it monkey. It was never far away from her. Marty referred to it as the Frankenstein monkey. He was seated across from her, scattered over the table, were several newspapers, open books, crumpled tissues, Grease's moleskin journal, and scraps of paper filled with mathematical equations, which looked like Egyptian hieroglyph hieroglyphics to Marty, and made just as about and made just about as much sense. But before I tell you, Grace continued, you have to promise not to say a word about it to anyone else. A promise between the twins was a sacred pact that could not be broken unless the one who had promised was released from the promise by the one who had asked for the promise. A promise was sealed by giving Monkey's remaining arm a squeeze. Marty squeezed Monkey's arm. Grace nodded and took a deep breath. Remember those nightmares I used to have when I was little? How could I forget, Marty answered. They nearly drove you crazy. Don't tell me they're back. They're back. Marty shuddered. No wonder she'd look so tense outside the weasel's door. The nightmares had bothered her from the time she was two and a half years old until she was six. When Grace was a little girl, two or three times a week, she would wake up screaming. And when she had calmed down enough to speak, she had virtually no recollection of what the dream was about. I thought you'd outgrown that, Marty said. The nightmares had stopped after the twins arrived at the boarding school. I did too. Grace shook her head. But they're back. Do you remember anything? Marty asked. No, but there's something very familiar about all this. Deja vu, as if I'd been through all this before. Well, I haven't, Marty said, feeling as if ants were crawling on his neck. Grace sometimes had this effect on him. She opened one of the newspapers and spread it out on the desk. Have you seen this article? He looked down at the newspaper. Accompanying the long article describing the accident was the dramatic color photograph of the twins' father, Timothy O'Hara. The, the photo had been taken by their mother, and the caption below it read, Sylvia O'Hara's final photograph. Mother's last kiss, he whispered, staring at his father's handsome face, trying to hold back tears. Their mother had believed that taking a photograph was like giving someone a kiss. She had told them if there was no affection, as the shutter released, the photograph was not worth taking. She must have taken this on Mount Everest, Marty commented. Their parents had reached the summit just before they flew off to South America to write an article about the rainforest. In the photo, their father was smiling at their mother with mild amusement. His oxygen mask and goggles were pulled down around his neck. His face was windburned and slightly paler around his gray eyes where the, goggle, where the goggles had been. It was a bright day, the kind of day their mother loved because it gave her photos something she called depth of field, meaning the background was sharply focused as the fort was as sharply focused as the foreground. Their mother was standing next to him, which meant she had put the camera on a tripod and set the shutter to release on its own. Her curly blonde hair spilled over her over the collar of her down parka. Her right hand was bare. You can't manipula manipulate a camera with mittens. A lighter, a light meter hung around her neck. Marty stared at the photograph so he didn't have to watch Grace cry. A lump the size of a chicken egg lodged in his throat. Do you think Mom got our Mother's Day card? The twins had sent a handmade card to her two weeks early, hoping it would get to her in time. I hope so. Grace said, reaching over and taking his hand. With his free hand, Marty picked up a used tissue from the table. Sylvia and Timothy O'Hare were the one of the most famous photojournalist teams in the world. Together, they had climbed the highest mountains, probed the deepest caves, and rafted the wildest rivers. After Marty and Grace were born, Sylvia hung up her cameras 
hung her cameras up and moved into a house in Missoula, Montana, while Timothy continued traveling and writing to support their new family. He was gone more than he was home, and he missed many of the twins' early accomplishments. At age three, Marty could run faster than his athletic mother. mother. At the same age, Grace had a vocabulary larger than most sixth graders. At four, Marty could unlock the back door and start the car. Fortunately, his legs were too short to reach the accelerator pedal. At the same age, Grace could add a long column of figures in her head and pick a lock as fast as a professional burglar. At five, Marty sculpted a statue of their neighbor's aggressive dog out of mud that looked so real his mother called the pound to have it picked up. At the same age, Grace began to learn French, decided she wanted to become a doctor, and started writing the first of many diaries using blank moleskin journals from Italy. Six of the blank journals arrived for her by mail every year directly from the company that made them. Her father used the same kind of journal to keep his notes for his articles. Grace suspected that he had them sent, but when asked, he would merely smile and say, they're from a secret admirer. The turning point for the O'Hara family came when the twins were six years old. Marty decided he wanted to catch a bear. He and Grace dug a five foot deep pit in the backyard, covered the opening with brush and caught their mother who became as angry as a bear. The twins didn't understand why she was oh, so upset. They had not used the sharpened stakes in the bottom of the pit, which the instructions had called for. Marty wanted the bear alive for show and tell at school. While Miss O'Hara was in the hospital recovering from her injuries, she got to thinking about the direction her life had taken. She missed her husband, she missed her former independence, but most of all, she missed the wild places her cameras had taken her to. If I'm going to fall into pits, I might as well get paid for it, she decided. And soon after her release, she took the twins and joined Mr. O'Hara in the field. This did not work for very long. Grace was afraid of everything that moved and many things that didn't. Marty was afraid of nothing except ghosts, which he had only read about. For the twins' own safety, the O'Haras decided that Marty and Grace should stay at home. They hired a succession of live-in nannies to care for the children, but none of them lasted long. One by one, these disgruntled women fled the house with hastily packed bags shouting back at the twins' panicky parents, your son is wild as a hurricane, and that daughter of yours is just plain weird. But they're only first graders, Mr. and Mrs. O'Hara would yell back helplessly, from, to which the fleeing na nanny would shout, first graders from... Well, you get the point. The O'Haras had a major problem with their minors, which was finally resolved when they discovered the Omega opportunity preparatory school while on a magazine assignment in the Swiss Alps. In many ways, the school had been very good for the twins. Grace was allowed to be as smart as she wanted to be, and Marty had learned to turn some of his wild streak into paint strokes and spices. But of the two, Grace liked the school the best. Marty merely tolerated it and tried to curb his wildness, so he, and more important, his weird sister, would not get booted out. He liked Grace that much. Grace and Marty spent several weeks with their parents every summer and saw them on most holidays, which was more than many of the other students saw of their parents in any given year. During the remaining days of summer, the twins were sent to camps and courses all over the world. Grace had attended medical camp, physics camp, astronomy camp, poetry camp, Shakespeare camp, and Latin camp. Marty had gone to mountain climbing camp, scuba diving camp, whitewater camp, and cowboy camp. It was not an ideal family relationship, but Grace and Marty had grown accustomed to their globe-trotting parents and accepted them for who they were, or at least who the twins thought they were.